All right, we've, as we've seen, John wrote his story of Jesus, his gospel last. He, he knew what the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had already recorded and what they had left out. So uh, he writes to fill in mostly some of the stuff that they left out. They tell us what Jesus did each day of his last week before his crucifixion. John just passes right over that. He goes in chapter 12 from the triumphal entry, jumps go to the end of the week, and the last meal, the Passover meal that he shares with the disciples that we read about here in John chapter 13. Now, we cover verses 1 through 17 on Sunday. It's one of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture. Of course, I said that about the passage of Scripture the week before that, too, because it also is one of my favorite. You know, Mary anointing Jesus' feet. I mean, how? come on. And then, so here we see Mary at Jesus' feet, and then the next week we're looking at Jesus at the feet of the disciples, washing their feet. Just, wow, such a great story. If you weren't here, I encourage you to get a copy of the, of the message from Sunday. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 17 because they lead into what follows. Won't really be much comment on, on those verses because, again, we covered them on Sunday, but we do need to read them tonight. Verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, or he loved them to the uttermost. And then he's going to demonstrate how he loves them. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's sons, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, he was bathed, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? And you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then... Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you, what? Do them. So Luke tells us that at this last meal, the disciples were doing their typical thing. They were arguing over who the greatest was. And so again, as he has done so many times before, Jesus has to correct them about their ideas of what it means to be great. It's in serving others, not in lording over them. Now again, we dove into the exposition of these verses Sunday. We are going to be coming back to some of them. Uh, verses 8 through 11 this coming Sunday, because there is a principle about how we walk with the Lord that's quite important there. So we'll, we'll look at that this Sunday. But before we go on, I want to riff a little bit <laughs> on what Jesus says here, imparts here, the lesson on the importance of serving. Throughout history, when believers, when the followers of Christ have faithfully followed Jesus' teaching here and his example and have been humble and have served others, the church has known its most fruitful and uh, effective time of ministry and work. It, it has really been effective in reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when the church has been persecuted. When the church has lived humbly and seen itself as a servant, including, most importantly, its leaders, it's remarkable how effective the world has been at seeing the lost converted to faith in Christ. Even being converted knowing that someone could be signing their own death warrant because to be a Christian meant to be persecuted, meant to be executed. And yet people understood the quality of the life that was found in those that had, that had renounced the world's ideas of greatness and power and embraced instead the example of Christ and his humility. Every season of spiritual declension in the church has been marked by 
the priority of service being traded in for an ambition to rule. The last wind of doctrine to blow through the evangelical church was called the emergent church movement. It's mostly blown out now. You know, we talk about winds of doctrine. That's one that blew into the church and <laughs> lasted for about five minutes and then blew out. But it left behind a lot of 30-somethings whose religious affiliation is a vague and lukewarm spirituality that lacks content. Emergent leaders wanted to make the gospel more relevant to a postmodern culture. And the key word, really, the, the main word in the emergent church movement was the word relevant. In fact, it even spun off a magazine, Relevant is a magazine that's still being published on, you know, how evangelical Christians can be relevant today. Now listen, friends, being relevant is good because we certainly don't want to be irrelevant, right? <laughs> that's right. It's important to be relevant. Every generation of Christians has understood the need to be able to speak to the language of its time, of its culture. But the mistake of some is altering the message for the sake of relevance. The gospel can't be changed. If you change the gospel, it loses its power to save. Let's face it, there are offensive parts of the gospel. Can I get an amen? The Bible itself says the gospel of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block. It's a scandal. It's a scandal. Our God, our Savior, died on a Roman cross, the most humiliating and excruciating way to die in all of history. That's our leader. That's the one we call our God and that we worship. And in order to come to faith in Christ, a person has to admit that they're broken and sinful and destined for hell. And that's difficult for people. It's offensive, deeply offensive. I'm sure everyone here who has ever shared the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you, you start to share, and you have to get to the message of sin, you inevitably have the person that you're sharing responds with something like, wait, are you saying I'm a sinner? <laughs> And it's like, almost like, put up your dukes. I'm going to sock you in the face. I'm not a bad person. <laughs> it's offensive to be told that we're sinners. So the gospel is a scandal. It, it is, it's a stumbling block. To avoid that, some blunt the gospel. They alter it. They edit it in an attempt to make it more appealing to their time. Excuse me. But here's the thing. Our time is just a manifestation of a fallen world. Friends, times change, people don't. The power of the gospel is that it's timeless. It speaks to those, to those things in us that don't change. Jesus is soon going to tell the disciples that while they are in the world, they are not to be of the world. A ship is made to be in the water, but woe to the ship that has the water in it. There must always be a certain moral and spiritual distance between the believer and the society that she or he lives in. Otherwise, we won't be the salt and the light that Jesus said we would be as we followed him. The desire to speak with relevance to our age must never give way to compromise with the age. One of the most important ways to safeguard our loyalty to the gospel is to set a guard on our ideas on what make for, listen, success. I would encourage every person in this room, every person watching on Facebook, everyone that listens to this later online, spend some time meditating on what your idea of success is. What will success look like for you? How will you know that you're successful? We are either going to define that by the terms of the world or the terms of God. We are going to determine our success either by the kingdom of God or the kingdom of man. Francis of Assisi met with the Pope. This was very early. He had just started. He had a few followers, and they, they went to Rome to uh, secure permission to become an official uh, order of the church, which today, of course, they got their permission, and we know them as the Franciscans. That's where they get their name from, Francis of Assisi. And while he's there in Rome, you know, he's this humble man. He goes barefoot. He he lives very close to nature. He's a mendicant, which means that he, he depends on, on the charity of others. Uh, Franciscans began, quite frankly, really well. And he goes to Rome with his little handful of followers, and he meets with the Pope, Pope Innocent III. 
And the Pope, here he is in all his regalia, you know, and he's showing Francis around what at that time was the Vatican. It's before St. Peter's had been built. But, you know, what they had of the buildings there, there's gold everywhere and all this treasure. And po the Pope is walking around showing Francis, uh, you know, look at all these treasures. Look how, look how we've been blessed. And he turns to Francis and he says, no longer can we say with Peter to the lame man, silver and gold have I none. Francis pauses and says, yes, and no longer can we say, rise up and walk. A church ambitious to adorn itself with the accoutrements of worldly success forfeits the power of the Spirit. In his epistle, James said, he who makes himself the friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. These first 17 verses of chapter 13 are a much-needed corrective to the perennial problem of power in the church. Greatness is serving, it's not lording. Amen? Greatness is serving, it's not lording. May we always keep that in mind. Verse 18, Jesus says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. And then he quotes from Psalm 41, verse 9. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. You see, Judas is still there. He's chilling with the rest of the disciples. Jesus' embarrassing example of washing feet, followed by his words about serving, confirms his decision to bail on, on Christ. He signed on with Jesus three years before because it was a dream come true. Ah, oh, being a disciple of a rabbi. You guys have all heard my message on that more times than you want to. But here we're back to it. I, he, he, you know, just think about it. When Judas was first called, oh my goodness, this is a dream come true, right? I get to, wait a minute, a rabbi is telling me to follow him? Yes. He signs up. Three years later, everything has changed. As he followed Jesus during that three years, the suspicions grew that Jesus was more than a rabbi. They began to believe that Jesus was who? The Messiah. And so Judas's ambitions rose even higher. He could be more than a disciple. He could be appointed to high office in the Messiah's kingdom. But as Judas watched the leadership of Israel turn against Jesus, and Jesus himself made it clear that a throne was not his destination, a cross was, Judas decided to crack cash out. Hey, look, that's just the way of the world. You have to look out for your own interests. And Judas was really good at that. Washing feet was nowhere near where Judas wanted to go. Now, Jesus knew of his plans to betray him and regarded Judas, Judas's betrayal as a fulfillment of Scripture. Verse 19, he goes on, Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. In just a few hours, the disciples' world is going to be turned upside down. It would begin with Judas's betrayal in Gethsemane. Jesus warns them that when it does all go down, they won't think that he's lost control of the situation. Now, did they believe that Jesus had lost control of the situation? Did they? Yes. <laughs> what did they do when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden? What did all the disciples do? Split. They left. For, from Gethsemane through Sunday, they lost faith in him. They assumed their entire world had been shattered. It wasn't until after the resurrection that they were able to look back on all that had happened and give God the glory that even when Jesus was in the hands of his enemies, he was still in control. Everything that happened needed to so that sin could be broken and redemption accomplished. And friends, that's the way that we're to live. We are to live with a confidence in God that can't be shaken, no matter what's happening to the world around us, no matter how the world around us is shaking. We know that the day is going to come when we're going to realize that God was in control from beginning to end. When our world was shaking, his throne was not. That's what we're, we're to live in the expectation of. Know that, friend. No matter how bad things are, no matter how dark they get, realize God has made you a promise and he cannot fail that he will work all things together for good to those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. We're to step into that certain future and live today as though we're already there. 
And that's what he's doing. That's what he says. When all this happens, you'll remember. Verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. In a few minutes, Jesus will speak about the Holy Spirit. And that's who he means here. The Spirit comes to make way for the Son who comes to make way for the, for the Father. And that's why Jesus will say, if you received me, you've received the Father. And if you really believe in the Father, you will believe in, in me. You see how he's back to that unity again, he and the Father. Verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, note how before he says those words, how John tells us the, the way in which Jesus spoke this. Please, please don't. Oh, I think that we get this image of Jesus sometimes, you know, that he was kind of emotionless, um, that he was very always just to, in total control. Well, he was always in total control. Uh, that, that he was emotionless, you know, that somebody would tell a joke and he'd go, eh. uh, and, and when he was bummed out, you know, he'd be like, oh. Look at what John says. Look how he uttered these words. He was troubled in spirit. He was troubled in spirit. He was, he's agitated. He's, he's bummed out. Why? Because one of them is going to betray him. Time is winding down now. The end is approaching. And as with any parting, Jesus is bummed. Doubly hard is that one of these guys that Jesus has poured himself into for the last three years is going to betray him. Betrayal by a friend leaves a deep wound, as some of us know. And the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. You know, because we know the story. We, we imagine Judas as the black sheep of the disciples. I mean, we, we think of, just think of Judas. And so many people, Judas, the name Judas, right? Who names their kid Judas today? In fact, we call somebody who's a, who betrays somebody. You go, you Judas. You know, it's, a, it's a slur. It comes from this guy. So we, we, we know what's coming, and, and we kind of think of Judas as, he wears a black leather jacket. He's got tats. He's got piercings everywhere. He wears shades. He's got d black hair. He paints his fingernails black. He's always over in the corner with one foot up on the wall smoking a cigarette, and he drives a Harley. <laughs> That's how we picture Judas. And like when Jesus says, one of you is about to betray me, all the disciples kind of lean back and point at Judas. Oh, we, of course it's Judas. Who else would it be? <laughs> we always knew. None of them knew. They're stunned. They have no idea who Jesus is talking about. There's been nothing in Judas's behavior up to this point to signal that he's the traitor. Now, there was leaning on Jesus's bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned, note that word, motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Now, understanding the typical table setting helps us get a better picture of what's going on here. So I have a, I have a picture. Here is a diagram of most likely of the arrangement for the Last Supper. The table was known as a triclinium, shaped in a, a like a, a capital C. Uh, people would sit around the outside of it, four on the two, two sides and then five on the back because there's 13 of them, right? 12 plus Jesus makes 13. And so you have four and four and then five on the long end. And then attendants would typically come into the middle and replenish the dishes in the middle. So you'd sit around the outside so you can, you can see each other. You can have fellowship. And this is the table that you would have um, people over so you could all be in fellowship and um, communication with each other. By the way, everybody didn't have their own plate sitting in front of them. You know, nice place setting. You got the little china plate there and you got the salad plate and you got the water cup and then you got the drink cup and you've got the two knives and the two forks. No. 
they had, uh, typically they would have some kind of a, a platter in front of them, but then you had bowls of food that were put, and two, three people would all dig into the same bowl. And so oftentimes you just have like, like on that one side that's got four, they would just put one bowl down. Now this is a Passover meal. And so the, the, what they're eating is, you tell me, what kind of meat are they eating at Passover meal? It's lamb. It's lamb. Now don't picture lamb chops. These aren't lamb steaks. This is a stew. They would take lamb and uh, almost kind of like pulled, pulled meat. They'd roast it and then shred it, and they'd mix it in with vegetables, and it goes in a big bowl, and then you take that nice, big, hot, flat bread, and you tear off a piece of it, and you use that, you put that in your hand, and you reach into the bowl, and you scoop out a handful, and you've made yourself a little lamb stew taco. Honestly, that's what you got. They don't have spoons. They don't have forks. You use this flat bread to scoop up the, the food, and you, you eat it like this. Now, who is the host of this meal? Who's the host? Jesus. He's the rabbi. He's their leader. He's the host. Remember now, and I should probably go ahead and show you the posture they're in. The table's about this high off the ground. They're on their left arm. A pillow is here. They're on their left arm because your left hand is unclean. You eat with your right hand. So this is the posture they're in. Jesus is second from the end. You see where he is up there, right? To his right and his left are the positions of honor. Now, it just says that uh, uh, John leaned on his breast. So where is John? John has to be over here, okay? And Peter motions to him. If I'm John at the end of the table, who can I see? Can I see these guys back here? Who am I looking at? Okay, so if Jesus is in the host position and John is at his right hand in the position of greatest honor, and then there's somebody on his left hand who we'll see that is in just a moment, unless you're looking up there and you already know. Pretend you're not looking up there and you don't know. Uh, so there's somebody who's in next of honor here, and then you go round the table in importance to the last position. And who's in the last position? Peter, because he's the one that's motioning to John, you see? Because the only person John can really see sitting at the end of the table is straight across. It's at Peter. That's why Peter's motioning to him. Hey, John, ask him who he's talking about, which also makes sense because when Jesus washed their feet, he washed their feet, and who's the only one we read about? Because he's the last one that Jesus washed the feet of. And you, that's why so Peter's sitting over there going, oh man, none of them, I'm going to score points. I'm going to score points by saying, Lord, you shouldn't wash my feet. I'll let all them prove they didn't get it. <laughs> so here's, uh, here's uh, Peter motioning. You know, John, ask him, ask him who it is. Verse 25, then leaning back on Jesus's breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Who's the only person that Jesus can hand the bread to? Jesus, John's here. He dips in the bowl. It's the person on his left. It's Judas. Judas is sitting in the place of second honor. He's sitting next to Jesus. This was an act of supreme kindness in that the rabbi, the host, is feeding Judas. He's, he's taking the host. This is the, you know, the person that's bestowing honor on others. He puts John here. He puts Judas here. John, you sit here. Judas, you sit here. Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Pete probably came in and sat here and Jesus, Jesus went, no, you go sit over there. <laughs> John, John probably sat in the last spot. Didn't Jesus teach on this? When you come in, sit in the lowest place so that you can be called up. If you take the highest place, the host may tell you to move down. Jesus taught this. So you get the feeling probably that's what happened. <laughs> Pete, what are you doing there? That's for John. 
And then he gives this. Think of the honor Jesus is bestowing upon Judas, the favor that he's, that he's showing Judas. Judas could be getting his own food. No, Jesus wants to give him honor. He wants to show him this favor and this blessing. But it had the exact opposite effect from what we'd expect. Verse 27, now after the piece of bread, whoa, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. No one at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things that we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. And having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. The battle over Judas over Judas's will, ended when he decided to press on with his plans to betray Jesus. He opened wide the door to Satan, who stormed in, eager to press forward his plan with the uh, priests to kill Jesus. Knowing the die was now cast, Jesus tells Judas to be about his business. The disciples assume that Judas, as the treasurer, was, you know, go pay the bill, Judas, for the dinner. Also, families at Passover would often go out into the streets, find poor people, and give them a gift right in the middle of dinner as a way that they could then go celebrate Passover as well because the idea was everybody needs to be celebrating Passover. And so you would you'd literally go outside your door, you'd send someone out with some coins, and you'd say, hey, listen, go, go help somebody else. They'd go out, find somebody, give them some coins, say, you know, go, go enjoy Passover. And then you'd come back in. It was a way to celebrate your own Passover by showing generosity to somebody else. Back in verse 2, John says that the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray him. The idea of betrayal was already there. Everything that happened at the meal confirmed for Judas what he has already decided to do. It's when Jesus offers him this morsel that Judas fully gives in and resigns himself to what he's already decided to do. He opens wide the door to Satan, who literally possesses him at this point. Now, friends, why does this piece of bread become the turning point? Why is that the trigger that allows the devil to enter Judas? Think about what that morsel was. What was it? It was the Passover lamb. Passover lambs that were offered are what delivered them from the destroying angel. And all of those Passover lambs that had been offered, every single one of them pointed to what? To Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Judas received that piece of bread, but he did so only as a piece of food. He is, in fact, even though he's pretending to receive this from Jesus, his heart despises this gift that Jesus is handing to him. Here's the hand. Here's the hand that will soon bear the nails. Dip in and take the Passover lamb and hand it to him. This is the hand of forgiveness. This is the hand of grace. This is the hand of the Lamb of God. And Judas takes that morsel, but in that moment, he is in fact rejecting God. He's rejecting Christ. He's rejecting salvation, knowingly. And then in doing so, he turns himself open. He opens wide the door for Satan to to enter him. Listen to Romans 2 in light of this story. Paul says, Do you despise the riches of God's goodness? forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Judas despised this honor that Jesus is bestowing upon him. He's taking this offer of restoration and forgiveness. Right in this moment, Judas, it's not too late. Right now, you can turn. You can, you can receive this with honor from me. You can change everything, Judas. You haven't gone out yet. Right now, you can change. 
And Judas takes this gift and he utterly despises it and ignores it. And at that point, he's gone. He's lost, irrevocably lost. He's past the point of no return. This is what happens to people who reject the gospel, who reject Christ. God comes to them and offers them eternal life, forgiveness, convicts them of their sin, brings them right to that crisis point of decision. They realize what they need to do is they, they need to surrender and they despise the mercy and the grace of God. Verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now... The Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. In light of the abuse and torture that Jesus is about to endure, how is God glorified in that? What is Jesus talking about here? Friends, this is difficult to explain because only the believer who understands the cross can grasp what Jesus is saying. What Jesus says here is why the cross is the symbol of our faith. The cross was an instrument of the cruelest death. It was utterly humiliating. In the Roman world of the first century, the cross was the epitome of shame. The victim destined to die on a cross was stripped, beaten to within an inch of his life, then nailed on this Roman gibbet, placed in a public place to serve as a warning to everyone else. This is what happens when you run afoul of Rome. Some victims would languish on the cross for up to three days if people would come by and give them water. Depending on the trauma that they had experienced ahead of time, they might expire within a few hours, as did Jesus. Because he was lashed with a cat of nine tails with 40 lashes. He had already been through a sleepless night. The blood loss had caused him to, his blood pressure to uh, drop. And then his, uh, so much blood had been shed that his blood had gotten so thick that his heart couldn't even pump it around his system, and eventually he died of a broken heart. We know that because when the spear went in, it says that blood and water flow, a sign of a ruptured pericardium, which is a sign of a ruptured heart. Jesus died of a broken heart. And he was naked, no loincloth. Modesty for the Jews was everything. To be uncovered in public was the height of shame, and of course the Romans were all about that. We We want to shame this guy. And he wasn't put up on the top of a hill far away. He was put along the side of a road. I'm sorry if this is shattering your romantic ideas about Calvary. Calvary was not the top of the hill. He was in front of the hill alongside a public highway. They wanted everybody to see this. And people would walk by and they would mock and they would spit. It was a humiliating way to die. And yet we have made the cross an emblem of honor. We make jewelry out of it. We use the cross as a way to identify ourselves. Um, Imagine someone with a necklace and a noose. Or a guillotine. Or a hypodermic needle. Or a little chair. It's like, this is an interesting looking chair. Yes, it's an electric chair. Why would you wear that as a piece of jewelry? Oh, it's where my God was killed. What? That's what the cross was. The cross has been transformed because in it we see the glory of Christ. Please listen. Please hear this. I know it's hard to understand. If it's hard to understand this, it proves how very contrary to the entire way of the world, the way of Christ is. Jesus says, look at it again. Let's go back and read this verse. Verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is what? Glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him what? 
immediately. What's he talking about? He's talking about the cross. We see the glory of Christ in the cross because it reveals God's love and how far he will go to save us. He'll go all the way. He gives himself. And in doing so, he flips the world's ideas of glory and greatness completely upside down. Think of this. Prior to the cross, what place did victims have in the world? What kind of attention was paid in ancient Egypt, China, India, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, or Rome? What kind of attention was paid to victims? Imagine someone in the Roman Empire who said, I'm a victim. Well, how would they be treated? <laughs> really? Awesome. Let's make them a slave. No one claimed to be a victim in the ancient world. The last thing that you wanted to be identified as a victim in the ancient world, there's no power in that. There's no honor in that. Why would you claim to be something humiliating? To self-identify as a victim was the quickest way to ensure more victimization. But all of that changed when Christianity took root in the soil of medieval Europe and blossomed into the Judeo-Christian worldview that forms the core of the modern world. Today, groups claim victim status for the perks it gets them. Sadly, many of those identifying as victims don't realize where the value of being one comes from. It comes from the cross and from Jesus' work there. It's from precisely what he says here that God is glorified in the death of Christ. How is he glorified? Why is he glorified? Because by choosing the Father's will, salvation is made possible for all people. Friends, it's through the cross that the eternal bride of Christ is secured. This one who looks like a victim hanging on a Roman cross is in fact the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the great victor over sin and death. But he becomes the victor over sin and death by becoming the victim of the cross. Think of this. In our society today, people claim victim. They claim the title. Because the work of Christ has completely flipped the world upside down. There's a value in the, the, the victim now. Because we realize that there is justice that is central to the heart of God. Verse 33, little children, I, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. Uh, sadly, missing from that translation is an implied, I shall be with you only a little while longer. It's really the intent of what he's saying. Jesus' his mission didn't end at the cross. Between his death and his resurrection, he went and preached to those that had died in faith in previous generations. It was his work on the cross that atoned for their sins too. Can anyone get to heaven apart from the cross of Jesus Christ? No, there's no way. Well, what about all those people that died before the cross? They went to a place the Bible calls Abraham's bosom. And they waited. They, they couldn't get into heaven until Jesus opened it for them. It's like he's got the key. And he goes to the cross, he dies. Before he rises, he goes to them and he goes, here's the key, you all been waiting for me. And they're like, woohoo. He rose from the dead and he led them all to heaven. That's what Ephesians 4 says. He led captivity captive. Okay, verse 34, here we go. And this, just, this deserves just a whole sermon of about five minutes on its own. This is, well, let's just read it. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. D don't we need a sermon of five minutes on that? No, I mean a sermon of five minutes. Like what we do is we read this and then I go, all right, go do it. Because like it doesn't need any explanation, right? How does that need any explanation? A new commandment I give to you, love as I've loved you. Okay, go. <laughs> As, as Jews, when Jesus spoke of a new commandment, what did they all think of right away? They're Jews. What, you know, a new commandment I give you. What, what new as opposed to, and what are the old commandments? Ten commandments, the big ten. 
That's, you're Jewish. That's what you think. It's what everything else is centered on, founded on, is the, the Big Ten. That word new is, is the Greek word kainos, and it means completely new. This isn't a new and improved, as in you had it already and we're just going to kind of update it. You know, it's n n commandment 2.0. It was a brand new commandment, brand spanking new. From now on, love for one another is to be the operating principle of their lives. And they don't get to decide what that means. They're to love one another as Jesus did. His love is their template. It's far more than emotion, it's action, it's movement. Verse 35, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have a bumper sticker on your car. If you have um, a t-shirt that says Calvary Chapel of Oxnard on it. By this all will know that you're my disciples by how big of a Bible you have. <laughs> We're going to start stocking these in the bookstore. So... Eric, can you, order, can you order some of those? Can you, can, okay. By this will all men know that you are my disciples by, um, by the kind of music you listen to, uh, by whether or not you know the definition of chiliism. Um, no. By this they'll know that you're genuinely my followers, by the love that you have for one another for love. How Peter responds may mean that he's not heard these last words that Jesus has spoken. He's stuck on what Jesus had said earlier back in 33 about leaving. Look at verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? It's almost like he hasn't been listening to the last words Jesus has been saying. The new commandment, Lord. No, he doesn't ask about it. Wait, 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 time. Where are you going? <laughs> Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. We know that Jesus meant he was going to heaven and that eventually Peter would get there too. But at this point, Pete has no clue. He assumes that as the Messiah, Jesus would soon be claiming Israel's throne. So all this talk about leaving confuses him. Is he talking about taking on the Romans? Which, of course, is the popular idea of what the Messiah will do when he comes, you know. So, oh, he's going to go take on the Romans. Well, wait, I want to go. I want to go. Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? <laughs> I'll lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you? And, and really, you know, this, please, we read this in English and it's so staid. You got to, here, here's Pete. Oh, Lord, I, I'll be willing to lay down my life for you. And you can see Peter, or Jesus, you know, Really, Pete? You think so? You, you know? <laughs> you lay down your life for my sake? And most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you've denied me three times. Jesus not only knew what was ahead for him, but for the disciples as well. He, he knew about the confusion that would come when he was arrested. He knew they'd run off in fear. He knew that Peter would eventually find himself in the courtyard of the high priest, warming himself at the fire there while Jesus is on trial. That a little servant girl is going to come and she's going to say, wait a minute, I think you're one of his disciples. And now Jesus is going to blow her off. No, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, get out of here, you runt. Three times. I don't know this man. And so Jesus tells him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He knew that Peter would mess up and that afterwards Peter would remember that Jesus warned him of this, but that Jesus still loved him. God knows us. He knows the good and the bad. He knows all about our weaknesses and failures. Of course, you, I know that none of you think this, you know, you... You were saved. You've been saved. You're, you're born again. I know no one ever thinks, wow, I wonder if 
I wonder if God knew what I would be like after I got saved. The struggles that I would have. Did, did God know every sin that you would ever commit after you were born again? Did he know? Did he condition your salvation based on, you know, I'm going to save you, but you better not ever mess up again. Did he know? Yeah. He knew. He knew Peter was going to, he knew that Peter was going to deny him three times and still, Pete, I know what's coming. I know what you're going to do. No, I would never do that, Lord. I would never do it. Not me. You got the wrong guy. No, Pete, I, I picked the right guy three years ago. I knew then what you'd do. But I know that failure is not the end of your story, Pete. Christian, failure is not the end of your story. When Jesus forgave you, he forgave the sins you haven't even committed yet. Courage was one of Peter's strengths. Courage is one of Peter's strengths. What was his profession? He was a fisherman. And historically we know that the Jews don't like the sea. They've been suspicious of it. In the Jewish mind, a dead body is unclean. It's a sign of the fall, a sign of the curse. If you touch a dead body, you become ritually unclean. You're not allowed to worship God until you've gone through purification rites. And in the Jewish mind, everything that dies, animal, human, everything that dies on the land, the rains come, the bodies dissolve, and eventually all the death that's in the world ends up where? In the sea. And so they, they're suspicious of the sea. They've never liked the sea. Historically, uh, Israel has never had a navy. Had a navy for a brief time under Solomon only because of his vast trading network that he established. But historically, Israel's never had a navy until modern times because they hate the sea, because they're suspicious of it. What was Peter? What was his profession? He was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. A place that's known for fierce storms. And we know they have them because there, several of them are mentioned in the Bible. He was not a chicken. He was a courageous man. And he's quick to rise to a challenge as well. Who do people say that I am? People offer different things. Okay, who do you say that I am? Peter, you're the, you're, the, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. He's a courageous guy. In the garden, when they come to arrest Jesus, it's Pete that brings out the sword and starts swinging. Now, he's a horrible, got a horrible aim. He's going for a guy's head and he ends up with an ear, you know, but <laughs> he's courageous. And it was his strength that was his downfall. We don't know what went through his head, but there they are in the garden. They come, they arrest him. Peter tries to defend Jesus. Jesus rebukes him. Put up the sword, Peter. Those that live by it are going to die by it. Peter doesn't know what to do. I, he, he took this stab and it didn't work. And in his confusion, he runs away. And then later he ends up following Jesus at a distance, makes it into the courtyard of the high priest. There is he's warming his hands by the fire. And who should challenge him? Who is it? It's a little girl, a little servant girl, a little servant girl little servant girl. <laughs> I think I saw you with Jesus. <laughs> and he starts cursing. No. The potential for our greatest fall lies in our greatest strength. When we look at our lives and say, you know what, I know there's stuff that God needs to work on in me. These other areas, I'm good in. I don't need help with those. I'm already there. That can very well be the thing that the enemy slips into and uses. Because we think, 
I don't need God's help with that. Listen to me. I'm sitting in the front row listening to the guy on stage teaching right now. You need God's grace and strength and help with everything. Everything. There is nothing that can't be the cause of your downfall, including your strengths. Your, your chief moral strength or courage or loyalty or humility, purity, generosity, honesty, integrity, those could be things that you're all doing well in. Don't be proud of it. Don't let a rousing victory march you into a boasting and gloating about how strong you are. Don't fall into the trap of saying, I would never, blank. Because those who say, I would never, inevitably end up saying, I never thought I would. 